Mordheim. There was a time when it seemed like the Empire itself was dying. Torn by a terrible civil war, the realm of Sigmar had fallen into anarchy and chaos. Come now to those dark and terrible days when the struggle for the throne of the Emperor divided brother from brother. Fires burn in the tomb-cold night as bounty hunters and ruthless mercenaries search for weird stones amidst the ruins of the eastern city of Mordheim. All that is left of a once proud city is blackened ruins devastated by a comet from the sky. And when the vigilance of the authorities lapses, the traitors and chaos worshippers gather. Corpses stir as practitioners of the forbidden art of necromancy emerge from their hiding places. The people of Mordheim pray for Lord Sigmar to deliver them from this horror. But these are dark times, when chaos is ascendant and walks abroad across the heaths and hills, corrupting those who fall easily into temptation. There is dark under the sun. Hello, and welcome to another video of me building the old world, or in this case, gluing myself to some near priceless Classic Mordheim terrain. Yes, today we are talking of Mordheim, City of the Damned. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Mordheim actually started out uh, in the pages of White Dwarf. So I've got here page White Dwarf 223. This was a period in time when, before games made their appearance in kind of mass-produced cardboard and plastic, they were first kind of floated in the pages of White Dwarf, and that's what Thomas Pyrrhon did with Mordheim, and uh, for that matter, Andy Chambers did with Battlefleet Gothic. Both of them made their first appearances in the pages of White Dwarf, and then over a year later, finally were released in uh, mass-produced plastic and cardboard boxes of awesomeness. Uh, but yeah, so White Dwarf 223, I was just reading to you from there, and that's where Mordheim first made its appearance. And then from there, over the next several issues of White Dwarf, you've got the basic rules for how to play the game, and some of the original warbands. Join me as I'm going to build some of Still mint on card, at least for the moment, until I get my hands on it. Uh, cardboard terrain from the Mordheim game. And uh, we'll take a little look at the history of Mordheim and the background of it. And yeah, let's see how we get on. So, okay, first things first. I'm not going to try and build all of this terrain. I think that was one of the mistakes I made when I was doing my building the old world Warhammer Fantasy 5th edition scenery. I'm just going to build one of the houses, but I've got the instruction manual. I've got a whole bunch of cardboard screws, and unlike when I did my 40k terrain video, I actually have all the cardboard sheets this time. I've not managed to leave one somewhere. I also have all the funky plastic accessories that went into making the Mordheim scenery, and I've actually pre-undercoated these, although they may not look it, given that they're still grey plastic. These have been given a simple grey primer undercoat so that they can be painted once they're glued onto the cardboard. That's probably the wrong way to do things, and there are people watching this video now screaming at me going, NO STOP! But yeah, so I think maybe a corner house? That might be a good start. A corner house? We'll see how we get on. I'll do a corner house. I'm not going to try something multiple story like the tavern, that's just going to get too complicated. Uh, Maybe the monument or a chimney as well, but let's see how we get on. So, yeah, first things first, what do I need? I need assemble the plastic frame and attach 7.1 and 7.3 as shown here. Then insert the windows. Well, I mean, this sounds relatively easy, so let's find 7.1, 2 and 3. I mean, logically, those would be on sheet 7, but... As the uh, Gorkamorka set showed me, that wasn't necessarily always the case. Yeah, no, in fact, they are all on the right page. So here we go. So, Mordheim! Mordheim, City of the Damned. Uh, I'm hoping that if you've turned up to this video, you're already an aficionado of Mordheim, uh, having either played it or played the computer game that came out years later. Um, just put that to one side for a minute. And then what do I need plastic-wise? Uh, I need a beam. Okay, those look like beams. Mordheim is... Uh, it's a really interesting setting in the wild fantasy world. It was a city in the Empire in the province of Ostermark, uh, essentially the eastern marches of the old world, of the old world of the Empire. That does not look like enough pieces. Do I have to bend it? Where does the window go? Oh, I do bend it. Okay. 
that still looks like it's missing a wall. That's because that's the wall. Ah, okay. <laughs> I know what I'm doing, honest, Gov. One of the most potent cities of that particular part of the old world, of the Empire, the Empire of the Men of Sigmar, uh, at that time. And in the year 1999, and you can tell that this was <laughs> came out at around the time of 1999, for those of us who were still alive to remember that back then, in the Imperial year 1999, the... Uh, Prophets and the portents said that Sigmar would be reborn. Uh, much like everyone seems to think that there's some kind of... I need a quarter of it. Uh, grand ceremony to the way in which humans count things. Uh, but nonetheless, they believed that Sigmar would be reborn. And Mordheim, as one of the most prosperous and powerful cities in the Empire at the time, was believed to be the site where this would take place. Uh, it was a pious and noble land that had originally... Been, a city that had originally been founded by a knightly order, the Order of the Raven. And, uh, yeah, citizens flocked from all over the Empire, convinced that they, their Lord and Master Sigmar was returning and they wanted to be there in hand. Both the pious and the less than pious put in an appearance. Are all the beams the same length? Yes, all the beams are the same length. Okay. And thus Mordheim filled up both with... Uh, doomsayers, flagellants, and also um, pleasure seekers, those who wanted to party away in the greatest party the Empire had ever seen. It is said that such was the depravity that this once pious city bore witness to, that it drew down a chunk of warp stone from the chaos moon Morslieb, which thundered across the heavens as a twin-tailed comet, seen by many as a, a portent of the return of Sigmar. Uh, but instead, this twin head comet rocketed down into the heart of Mordheim, obliterating the city, as you can only imagine, tearing a huge crater right through the heart of the city. And, um, yeah, killing almost everybody who was present in the city at that time, and scattering chunks of essentially radioactive waste all over the city at that point. What goes there? That window thing there. Oh, okay, so that's, that just lodges in there. Ooh. Okay, that... Uh, that seems really easy, but I feel like that might benefit from some glue, because I don't feel like I've glued myself to anything yet. But I'm wary of using super glue on this, so I'm going to try using some PVA on this, and we'll see if I horribly mess this up or not. Uh, I'm just going to run a bit of PVA along the edge of this, and glue it into that little corner bit. Good old-fashioned white school glue. I mean, what can possibly go wrong? Uh, yeah, it obliterated almost everybody who was still living there, with the exception, interestingly, of the Sisters of Sigmar, a priest, a nun, an order of nuns, essentially, Sigmarite nuns, um, who dwelt in a sanctuary on top of a, a high promontory within the city. There we go, that goes there. Okay, let's try a bit of glue on. This is going well. I'm not confident it's going to continue going well, but I'm... Relatively pleased thus far. Uh, but it also then drew treasure hunters and magisters of chaos and all manner of mad, bad and dangerous to know types, including the Skaven from all across the old world, uh, to essentially try and gather either some of the gold and the fortune that was left over from the sort of the other opulent palaces and and places of learning that had been there. Yeah, this is starting to go wrong now. Good, good. Ah! There we go. Right. Just going to leave that sat there for a minute. Okay, that worked well enough that I'm going to try an, another corner house while I talk to you some more about Mordheim. This really is some beautiful cards, by the way. I don't know if you can see the, the print job on this. And it's still basically pristine before I got my grubby mitts on it. Ah, and what? All of these seem to have these random little bits of floorboards and planks and stuff as well, which is quite cool. Okay. Yeah, um, opulent treasure left lying around the place after the previous owners had all horribly died with the comet, you know, falling on them. Uh, and beyond that, huge chunks of weirdstone, huge chunks of solidified green magical rock that had fallen from the moon, pure magic of chaos, 
imbued into solid form that would be worth its weight in, well, its weight in gold to, you know, magisters, chaos types, and all other types uh, that uh, are up to no good and want to use dark magic to do so. And therefore those who find it and can sell it to them without getting horribly mutated or corrupted along the way. It was, essentially, it was a sandbox. The idea behind Mordheim was it was a city, city that until that point hadn't really featured massively in the background of uh, Warhammer, but served its purpose as a setting in which a, an awesome skirmish game could take place with sufficient reason as to why you weren't just fighting through a you know a populated city with law and order and all the other things that would make fighting in a uh, urban environment perhaps somewhat less interesting uh, and also yeah it gave a reason why all these different types would be coming over to this part of uh, the old world and uh, fighting over the ruins it was really nicely presented in the pages of White Dwarf, and the book that they eventually produced for it was beautiful. Um, just briefly sharing with you some of the stuff that they put up on here. The original um, Mordheim article, when they first uh, were playing around with this, they used whatever cardstock scenery they had lying around. At this point, it wasn't yet this beautiful card stuff scenery that I'm in the process of ruining right now. It was, um, you know, existing Warhammer village building pieces like I'd shown in my previous Warhammer terrain building. It was see card stock scenery like the Dwarven Brewery from uh, Grudge of Drong that, again, they just had lying around. But what's really cool is that uh, they actually built an entire miniature map of Mordheim just to try and show off what it's like. And I think this is a beautiful little piece. It never really featured anywhere beyond this. I mean, they used uh, all kinds of uh, little kind of bits and pieces. I think there's some Mighty Empires bits in there as well. It was from there then that the rest of the stuff kind of grew forth. So the next issue we learned a little bit more about how the rules would work. And it, there's a little bit of Necromunda about Mordheim, there's a little bit of Warhammer kind of fantasy, and there's some of the stuff that would eventually become part of Warhammer Skirmish about uh, Mordheim. But it's it's different in its own unique way as well. So whereas Necromunda is very much about firearms, Mordheim, although missile weapons play a part, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm going to throw some crossbowmen into my gang when I eventually get around to building a warband. Um, there was much more to it than that. There was the, the benefit of all the different types of weapons, and it was a game that would only grow as time passed. Uh, it was also a game where there weren't miniatures for it yet. So when they published the rules for all the different warbands, then, uh, and the initial warbands that they published in here, there were uh, the human mercenaries that had not yet been broken down into the different uh, realms. There was the, the, the possessed, so the chaos gangs, the uh, magisters who've come to seek power there, the witch hunters who've come to hunt the possessed and the magic witch hunter gangs, and the skaven warp hunters, who were the initial gangs who first made their appearance, all had much more that were different about them compared to, say, the different Necromunda houses that had been part of the, the 40k skirmish game at that point. The other thing I loved about the way that they appeared in White Dwarf at that point was it coincided with when uh, Warhammer Monthly was uh, running, and if you haven't watched, I've done a couple of little videos about Warhammer Monthly, check those out. But you've got these little one-page stories, like I'm just showing you here. I mean, this is Dan Abner. This is Dan Abner writing a single-page story that all on its own tells everything you need to know about Mordheim. Um, from there, we got the different scenarios that you could play, and again, each month, it was just something new that you could add to your games of Mordheim. It was almost like gaining a new game in part installments, which I suppose is a bit like what they've done with the Imperium and the Stormbringer magazines now. Um, what I loved in particular about this was this was the era when I was running a, a Warhammer club at my local at my school, and Mordheim very much lent itself to a, a, a budget as a kid. If you were looking for something that you only needed a few miniatures for, and I was able to do my Mordheim gangs with basically what I had in my bits box and a few Warhammer sort of five pound starter boxes that easily fit into my pocket money, uh, but they were also games that you could play in like half an hour or you know 45 minutes which my warhammer club that i ran at my school ran after school for about 45 minutes before you know parents came and picked you up at half four and this was ideal i have fond memories of being sat in my school library with 10 or 20 other kids who were all mad about warhammer whilst a very kind but somewhat bored teacher sat behind the desk reading and we battled it out across cardboard buildings that we'd built at home you know much better than i am at building cardboard scenery now and speaking of which uh that goes 
in there. These instructions could be easier to follow because I'm an idiot and yeah, struggling a little bit with this. Give it a go. So corner base is that, okay. Why didn't I have one of those on the other one? I should have had one of those on the other one. That explains it. That explains why that's not quite right. Because that should be up there like that. And that should be on the bottom. Right! Ha ha! That looks so much more sturdy now that I've built it properly. Okay, I need another one of those. What we were waiting for eventually was for this to come out. So this is why Dwarf three, three, uh, 238. And this was where Mordheim as the game we, we know and love launched. And actually it's also where Town Crier launched. And I'll come back to more about that in a minute. Um, Mordheim, when it launched as a game, was an awesome set. You got a big black rule book with a huge kind of crow on the front. And actually, it wasn't until later, reading more about the history of Mordheim, that I realised why a crow on the front of the book. But of course, it goes back to the Brotherhood of the Crow, or the Brotherhood of the Raven, the knightly order that founded Mordheim when it was still a noble and loyal city. But you also got a whole bunch of sprues of what would become to be known as Empire Free Company. Uh, essentially, humans in kind of rough, rugged peasant garb. I suppose the equivalent to uh, the, the Mordheim Ganger kit that we would let, later see. But you also got a whole bunch of kits that are still in use today. The Skaven Night Runners kit, which is an awesome kit. Skaven filled with kind of two-handed Wolverine-style fighting knives and slings and ninja stars and all the cool kind of stuff that makes up Clan Eshin. I want to say thanks to a guy called John Busby in the comments from one of my previous videos. Thanks, John, for the suggestion about bulldog clips. I couldn't lay hands on some bulldog clips, but instead I got the next best thing. Tiny pegs! Tiny pegs, which will hopefully spare me having to hold things for ages and ages and ages while I wait for the glue to dry. So in that vein, I'm going to break out my trusty Pritt stick and try gluing this. So as well as this cardboard scenery, the big black book with all the rules in... Uh, and those kits, you've got a whole bunch of little funky tokens. And I've got all of these on these cardboard sprues here, actually. I've basically got everything except for the rule book and the original box at this point. Because I've got all the other models that I need. And I'll be doing some future videos building a human gang and building a Skaven gang at some point. So that eventually I can use these for some games of more time. Um, the main big black book introduced some different gangs, so as well as uh, having humans, possessed, skaven, and witch hunters, we gained the Sisters of Sigmar, the nuns that I'd previously mentioned. Uh, we also gained a bit of diversity in terms of the human gangs. Human mercenaries broke down into Reichlanders, Marienburgers, and Middenheimers. And part and parcel of this is what's quite cool, was this was during a period known as the Time of the Three Emperors. So this was uh, before the Wars of the Vampire Counts, and, and long before where we'll be when the uh, Warhammer the Old World comes out. I mean, it's about 300 years before that. But this was a time when there were multiple claimants for the Imperial Throne, and uh, they were essentially looking for any edge that they could find. And what was quite cool was you could therefore make the mercenaries as they appeared from the starter box into any of those different factions, and then you could add a bit more kind of uniqueness to them and to their character by buying some of the metal miniatures that they released that added, uh, you know, more kind of... like, more opulent feathers for the Marienburgers, more um, militaristic armour for the Reichlanders, uh, big hairy cloaks for the Middenheimers. But yeah, it gave you a more unique look to your different human warbands and then you could pick them up in whatever kind of approach you wanted. Uh, the rules as well worked in this race. The Reichlanders were, because they were more, more militaristic, their crossbowmen, their uh, archers were a higher ballistic skill. Uh, the Middenheimers, their champions, were just stronger because they're big, hairy, muscled guys in wolf cloaks. And my personal favourite, the Marienburgers got more gold to spend because they were just from a naturally wealthier area so they had more money to spend on fancy weapons like dueling pistols or big feathery hats. Uh, what was cool then was the ongoing support that Mordheim got from uh, Games Workshop for the pages of White Dwarf for a couple of years after that and then beyond that in the Fanatic magazine supplements that they produced there was additional rules, there was... Um... Oh that's one thing I forgot to mention, I mentioned the vampires, 
Yeah, vampires was a faction. They, they say it was the days before the Wars of the Vampire Counts when Vlad von Karstein was still an extremely pale and long-lived member of the Imperial nobility who happened to rule over Sylvania. It was only later that people began to twig that perhaps there's long-lived and there's still being around a couple of hundred years after you'd taken the throne. But yeah, it was... Uh, Supported in the pages of White Dwarf with all kinds of additional rules, additional war bands. They did rules for Dwarven Treasure Hunters, which is what I used to use down at the local gaming club. There was um, rules for um, Orcs or Bretonians. There was new scenarios. There was a lot of support. And then this, as I said, was, was appearing in the pages of White Dwarf under the heading of Town Crier. Like it was its own little newspaper that was published uh, for Mordheim, which I thought was quite cool. And then when they launched the independent Fanatic range, when they started doing uh, essentially Fanatic Mag and individual little magazines for the different specialist games, as they were known then, Town Cryer began to be published on its own. It got about two years' worth of issues out of it before it was eventually discontinued. And all of this resources can easily be found online today. And it actually was also recombined in something that was very cool that Games Workshop did at the time. They did something called the Living Rulebook, which was after they'd stopped selling Mordheim as a game, you could still get a PDF of it, uh, which enabled you to keep playing it, even, you know, because they made all the models for it, enabled you to keep playing it if that was something you were interested in doing, if you couldn't lay your hands on a copy of the book. And, yeah, that's only continued in terms of the support that the the fan community offers that now. So there's some awesome Mordheim Facebook groups that I've joined that have been very helpful in researching this video. Um, they may not thank me for saying that because I probably sound like a gibbering idiot, but there we go. That's a window. Hooray! Uh, but also, there was um, a, a second supplement that they produced as a result of what came out in the pages of Town Crier and Fanatic Mag. That was known as Empire in Flames, and essentially the idea there was to take the the battles of Mordheim into the Empire at large. So you didn't have to just be constrained to fighting in the City of the Damned. You could fight in the, the woods of the Drakwold. You could fight in the various villages or hamlets across the wider Empire. You could fight in a full-blown city if that's what took your fancy. And that led them to producing more kind of bizarre uh, warbands. I mean, we got some, some warbands from some of the other provinces, like the Osterlanders and the Avalanders got representation during the course of this time. But then beyond that, we started to get things like the Carnival of Chaos has to be the best example, um, with a Nurgle-themed group of clowns and comedians, complete with plague bearers, acting out Shakespearean roles, and Nurglings playing musical instruments as the orchestra. Um, they also produced things like huge beasts, like the Thing in the Woods, uh, an awesome stagecoach model that saw a lot of use in Vampire Count's armies as an alternative for the Black Coach. And yeah, Mordheim then it went quiet for a while before getting a huge resurgence about eight years ago when they re released Mordheim City of the Damned as a computer game. And then that was a whole new world of uh, people who are watching this video. You may have come to me watching me gibber about this and wondering what the hell I'm doing talking about toy soldiers and bits of card. You may not know. It was originally, uh, yeah, it was a miniatures game, but it became this fabulous computer game. And there was even a mobile game version that was produced as well. Mordheim is, is a game that I, uh, many people, I'm sure, would love to see return. Um, it's not something really that could... Well, it is it that could make an appearance during uh, Warhammer the Old World. Warhammer the Old World is rumoured to be set in the time immediately before Magnus the Pious. Magnus the Pious was one of the most famous of all the emperors, probably after Sigmar, the most famous, and Karl Franz, the most well-known of all the figures in imperial history. Uh, he united the empire after centuries of open war between the different claimants for the imperial throne, and uh, he crushed the probably the greatest incursion of chaos that would be seen until the end times, the chaos incursion of uh, Chaos Lord Cull. But one of the things he did after he crushed the Chaos Invasion at the city of Kislev, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Prague in Kislev, is he turned around and took his victorious army, and on the way back into the Empire, he basically stopped off at Mordheim on the way and decided to clean house and destroyed Mordheim. He had the whole city smashed by batteries of cannon fire and what was left burned to the ground, and the ground, you know, the ashes salted. Thus, he thought, cleansing the, the old world of a blight upon its, you know, uh, appearance. A scum of hive of scum and villainy. Um, what's interesting is 
in the background, years later, they would add in an element that it was not, in fact, as destroyed as was once thought. Part of the background of Mordheim was that the huge crater in the centre of the city was uh, essentially a pit going almost the way down towards the centre of the earth, uh, with the largest shards of uh, weird stone still at the bottom. And it was actually in this pit that uh, one of the most sort of preeminent villains of the old world and the Age of Sigma and 40k today was located. And that is Belakor, the Dark Master. The Dark Master is one of the names that he took both in sort of during the Albion campaign and in Mordheim, where he was also known as the Shadow Lord. And what was quite cool was during the time when um, Mordheim was being released, all the various possessed warbands and so forth often claimed they were fighting on behalf of the Shadow Lord, this dark and mysterious power at the centre of the pit, at the heart of Mordheim. Uh, later, this was uh, linked into the Dark Master, and again, the dark and mysterious chaos power that was at the heart of the Albion campaign. And this would later turn out to be Bellacor, uh, who is got recently got a, a very cool kind of glowed up model and got a huge background as being the first demon prince of chaos. What they did with the, some of the stories right before the end times was they introduced the idea that parts of Mordheim had not been destroyed, but rather shifted out of uh, stick, shifted out of um, the main dimensions, essentially, that it had been pushed beyond the realms of time and space. Something I suppose it's got a lot in common with um, Shadespire in the more recent Age of Sigmar storylines. Uh, but that therefore there was almost a dark reflection of Mordheim that still existed, uh, which uh, Bellacor was trapped in. And Gotrek and Felix, again, there's never trouble, with, but Gotrek and Felix aren't far away, uh, would journey there at one point, and uh, there's a whole novel, City of the Damned, that they feature in, which is well worth a read. But again, I suppose what's quite cool is, thinking about it, if the old world is set before the time of Magnus the Pious, then Mordheim would still exist, so there is nothing to stop them. I'm not sure that they will, there's nothing to stop them from re-releasing Mordheim, or releasing Mordheim in some way. Can I just say, Games Workshop, if you're watching this, a made-to-order of Mordheim, yes please. I know I've got the cardstock here, but it doesn't matter, I would gladly buy a box set of that. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing to stop them from doing that if they really wanted to, I suppose. And equally, there's nothing to stop you when the old world breaks from theming an army around something connected to Mordheim, whether it's one of the nefarious warbands that travelled there, or, you know, some kind of dark and mysterious chaos cult that's based out of it, or a mercenary warband for one of the Imperial claimants to the, uh, the throne of the Emperor um, battling for, for dominance of Mordheim. That would make a cool setting for a, a campaign. Hmm, thinks about possible old world campaign once the rules land and he gets his hands on a copy. Okay, well, uh, it kind of turns out like maybe I can build cardboard terrain. Just, you know, read the rules first. Who would have thunk it? Some final thoughts about Mordheim then. Uh, what makes Mordheim such an endearing game for so many people even today? If I mentioned Mordheim, Mordheim to any kind of grognard, from who was into gaming in the early in the late nineties, uh, early thousands, uh, I think they'd get misty eyed about it, even if they were a forty k player, just because it's got such. I think first of all, such an enduring setting. It is the idea of um, in a land that's already perhaps somewhat grim and dark, a completely post apocalyptic ruined city that there has no rules and you can battle over for power and glory is an enduring setting. I think this is something that perhaps Warcry is the natural successor to Mordheim. It's the great skirmish game. The rules are brilliant, but the setting doesn't ignite the imagination in quite the same way. Um, being gangs of uh, chaos warbands or whatever that are battling over the different resources available at the Varan Spire or the Realm of Beasts or whatever the setting happens to be this time round doesn't hold the same narrative that the idea of a, a ruined city where the streets aren't necessarily paved with gold, they're sheeted in blood, but nonetheless fortunes can be made. That's an enduring setting. I think part of what makes it an enduring setting as well is the amazing artwork from John Blanche. Um, again, just throw up some examples of that here. Mordheim, more than anything else, is a setting that lends itself to John Blanche's art style. I know his 40k work is much loved and amazing, but I think for, for, for the modern... Modern Hieronymus Bosch approach, almost, that John Blanche's art approaches, 
Mordheim is the perfect example, even down to the random fish that are everywhere. I think someone asked John recently on one of the um, Facebook groups, because he is quite happily active on Facebook and usually quite happy to answer any politely phrased questions that people put to him. Uh, someone asked him why all the fish everywhere, and uh, he simply said that he'd read something somewhere about a rain of fish being one of the signs of the apocalypse, and therefore he imagined that there would be lots of fish everywhere. I think that's brilliant! I mean, even down to, I remember when I was playing Mordheim as a kid, there was an explanation of, oh, it helps this keep the, the Skaven away. And it's the idea that there is nothing in the books that suggests that this was the case. But uh, almost a modern superstition has grown up around the, the artwork of Mordheim such that people then thoroughly believe that that was the intention of it. That, that wearing, you know, rotting fish nailed to you would in some way blunt the Skaven's sense of smell as opposed to making it ridiculously easy for them to track you. Who knows? I think beyond that as well, what makes it an enduring game is it was very easy to access. The rule system was very simple. Like I said, I was able to play it when I was only a you know, young kid. And it not something that you need to invest a huge amount of brain power in, but it's still quite dynamic in terms of its action. I'm hoping to get some games in. I'm going to do, like I said, some future videos. I've got a whole bunch of the sprues of the different troops. I'm going to do one video making some human a human warband and one video making a Skaven warband. And I'll talk you through my process of what I'm putting into each of my warbands and how I'm building the models. And you can see that I'm equally inept at building plastic kits as I am at building cardboard scenery. Um, but... I think hopefully once I've got those built and I get a game video in, you'll see what it is about Mordheim that captures the imagination. Um, for now, I'm just going to leave you with um, this thought about it. Old games aren't dead as long as people play them. And I know I've done quite a few videos about old games recently. I've done my Battlefleet Gothic video. I'm doing this. I talked about 5th edition fantasy. I'm always excited to see the new stuff that Games Workshop puts out, but there is nothing wrong with diving into a classic game that perhaps maybe something you enjoyed as a kid, maybe something you didn't even get to play because it came out before you were into the hobby. Um, there is a lot of resources out there for those who want to get into those games. Um, drop me a line in the comments if you want to be pointed in the direction of any of the cool Facebook groups, and I'll throw links to those uh, your way. Uh, there are a lot of supportive gamers out there who are happy to help you get into these games if that's something you're interested in. So I guess that's what I would hope to leave you with on this, is... Um, more time maybe give it a try maybe see if some of your local gaming group would be up for putting a warband together there's nothing to stop you using some of the modern miniatures that are released now you don't have to pay ridiculous ebay prices for stuff if you want to play this game there's nothing to say you need any of this cardboard scenery now again you can use any of the existing scenery kits that i talked about in my warhammer fantasy video um equally there's nothing to stop you making your own scenery out of cardboard i guess that's all i'm saying is there is nothing to stop you on that bombshell, uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I will catch you next time. Bye for now.